But number one, just what are the sales manager, the challenges sales managers face today? We think that's been evolving. Obviously, we're living in a hybrid world. Things are opening up at different rates in different parts of the uh, world. What are the key management skills that lead to revenue results? So there was that video that played as an introduction said managers can often get caught up in a daily grind, but is everything we're doing really leading to improving team performance? And then, you know, when people make the transition into management, they may not have received any formal training. They may have just moved from a top sales performer to becoming a manager, but what, what is it we've really done to train them to coach, manage, and lead a team? So we want to talk about that. And then I think very interesting, just kind of what we've learned about how learning has changed during the pandemic and not only changed, but improved and how we're able to collaborate in a way that we probably could have in the past, but really didn't take advantage of uh, historically. And I think that that's really led to some better training outcomes. So with that, let's just uh, open it up. We'd love to, as Ray said, it's gonna be interactive and we're gonna open up a chat, please on your chat, try and open it up to everyone. There's a little drop down at the bottom and just share with us, what are the challenges your managers are facing, you know, heading into 2022? We've probably been now in a pandemic for over a year and a half. And, you know, people have adjusted, things are opening up again at different rates, but what are some of the challenges that you're seeing um, going into next year? Yeah, it'll be really interesting to hear uh, from the audience, Norman. And, you know, I was at a, a conference uh, a couple of weeks ago and on a panel about how is sales changed? You know, how are things evolving? And the very strong consensus was at least the realization that we're never going back. And so whatever 2018, 2019 looked like, there's a blend now. And in some cases, our customers like uh, a virtual um, engagement. Uh, we're gonna have some mix of in-person and virtual and even workplace uh, these days, I think we're seeing a hybrid or blended work uh, situation emerging, especially with many large companies. So what are you seeing in the, in the chats here? Well, I think I saw one of them was, you know, just about, you know, time management. Obviously, you know, we're slammed back-to-back -back meetings. I look at my own calendar today. We'll talk more about that later. Coaching poor performers, you have an underperformer. How do you really deal with that during a pandemic? It's obviously a kind of a crazy job market. And you know, managing underperformers is, is challenging at any time, but maybe even a little bit more during a hybrid environment. Um, attrition, a lot of people are choosing not to come back to the workforce. Uh, I also know it's a very tight labor market. So those are some of the themes that I'm picking up on. Ray, what are you seeing? Yeah, I love Brent's comment about micromanagement as symptoms mm. of the newest uh, or, or they're being quickly promoted. So maybe they don't have the skills. And also we're trying to figure out uh, how to deal with people when we can't necessarily see them, right? Or we can't walk around the floor, or we can't go right along with them. Um, we can't meet buyers in person, as Francois mentions, and switch to virtual, but there's, there's a resistance. So I think all of these come up both for our sales team and maybe uh, uh, amplified for the managers, right? Of how do you manage in that environment? Right. I'm seeing a really interesting comment also about the challenge of focusing on sales results. And we always think about results as being, you know, kind of trailing indicators of performance and sales activity and development as being the leading indicators. And there was a comment in here about well, hyper focus on results and not enough about developing people. And really, when you think about a sales manager's role, it really is about developing people and getting them primed to not only meet, but exceed their numbers and continue growing their careers seeing turnover again. So we saw attrition, we saw turnover, uh, challenges getting face-to-face -face meetings and some of their salespeople may be much more effective face-to-face. -face. How do they, as a manager, help their sales team prepare to sell virtually? Mm -hmm. uh, just really appreciate all the participation. There are way too many comments for us to go through all of them, but really just a great uh, engagement. You know, How do you get people to engage uh, when mm -hmm. you're managing virtually? So there's, there's just a ton of challenges going into 2022. But the good news is a lot of companies are really addressing these challenges and doing surprisingly well uh, despite the headwinds. Yeah, absolutely. And I just, a couple of these really stood out. Miguel mentions that managers may have a negative para paradigm around learning because they think it's really all about sales training or all about the reps. Uh, and how do we get the managers to take that responsibility? We'll touch on that. And then Christina had a really interesting comment about in some cases, people have gotten very comfortable with virtual. They like working in the home office 
and we need to get them back. So how do we motivate them? So I think there are challenges around performance management, around coaching, around leadership, really all the topics we're going to get into today. Sounds great. <clears throat> So let's just chat a little bit about some of the challenges. And I think there was probably way more in the chat than we would have ever thought of, but back-to-back -back meetings, I mentioned, you know, if I look at my own calendar yesterday, today, it's like every half hour, there are very few breaks. So it's really hard to have in-depth conversations with people when you're going from one meeting to another. Many of these may be virtual sales meetings where you're coming in as the manager. Accountability, you know, to people have teams that are spread out, people working from home, uh, in the home, there's multiple challenges that people may face today still from the pandemic. Um, responding to urgent requests, you know, we, um, we're on Microsoft Teams. I see uh, messages coming in throughout the day. I've got messages coming in on my phone throughout the day. Some of them are urgent. Some of them are perceived to be urgent. Customer issues are not as easy to solve. I know in many industries, there are supply chain issues today. Really hard when you can't meet delivery dates, when you don't have the uh, parts that people are looking for, the supplies that are people looking for. I was with a friend last night who's in the uh, construction industry. He said so, even simple things like paint, they can't get the paint they use. So now that they are turning over a um, building, they have no choice either. They can't do touch up because they can't match. They either have to repaint or leave it the way it is. So just numerous challenges today. Managers are asked to provide all sorts of forecasts. I was on a call with a company, a publicly traded company. The manager was lamenting to me, I can't get anything done. They keep asking me to forecast and re-forecast Q4. And then how about enough time for ourselves as managers and leaders, we want to grow. So making time for ourselves and development. So numerous challenges uh, that we face, but all the challenges are things that we have to and need to deal with as we prepare for success in 2022 and beyond. Yeah, and I think it's interesting that uh, a, a number of these challenges were in place already, and then we've added the hybrid work on top of that and virtual and the, the, the current uh, challenges with you know, clients, supply chain, et cetera. So I, I think if there are any sales managers uh, joining us today, they're probably nodding going, yeah, that's, that's what the, our world looks like. And that frontline manager job is just especially challenging because it is so visible, right? It's like uh, the coach of that, that sports team where winning and, and visibility and keeping score is something that's pretty evident. And so we have all of that on top of us. So let's talk about some things we can do to address that and really the key management skills that lead to revenue results. So we'll share a little bit of background and some of the, the work that we've done around this, but we really think about uh, if you picture sales training, which most organizations have some type of development, right? Product trainings, uh, skills training, training their sales teams and onboarding. And then maybe there's general leadership training. They're talking about how do they develop their, their leaders for the future. But in the sweet spot in the middle is really that focus on sales managers and where they come together. And I liken it for better or worse, but use the analogy of, you know, everybody might go through boot camp, but the special forces get their additional training because that's a unique skill set. And I think we should think about our sales managers that way that we really need to apply special forces training because managing a pipeline, managing selling skills, managing a deal and helping our reps close more business is a very specific thing. And it requires kind of a higher level of those management activities. Anything you'd add to this, Norman? Yeah, so Ray, I recall when we you know, started you know, really promoting this, this viewpoint you know, several years ago, and it was pretty foreign to most companies when we would you know, talk with clients and say, well, we have, a, you know, we have a robust sales training program. We've adopted this sales methodology. We have an onboarding program. And they say we have a leadership development program. But it really, I think over the last several years, companies have come to realize that those, as you call them, special forces, but sales managers do, uh, require a unique set of skills that are unique to the frontline sales manager position. We often think of them in our high impact sales manager program as, as five pillars. And, and Ray will share with you kind of what those five pillars look like, which really tie to the management responsibilities that are unique to, to, to frontline sales managers. Yeah, and if we can think of this as kind of a, a, a journey, right? We oftentimes, if there is sales manager training, it's really focused on maybe coaching, coaching a deal or coaching a methodology. Maybe we think about that, oh, we trained them, so let's coach the managers on how to coach that particular uh, tool or process, but we don't think about how to build better managers. So this really looks at from the very first, how do we get the right players on board? 
and apply that behavioral based interviewing. Maybe there's some general training uh, in the business, but uh, recruiting training. But how do we apply that to what a star rep looks like and what those competencies are and those behavior questions? How do we set and manage expectations? How do we manage the pipeline and the forecast and make sure we have a clear uh, view of, of what that looks like going forward? And then how do we coach deals and skills? And ultimately, how do we build a vision for our sales team? How do we lead and motivate them going forward? So it's a much bigger perspective than really just you know, coaching that sales meeting or coaching a particular deal. So I think we wanted to get a poll here. So we'll ask for some help opening this up uh, and just get an idea. And this is a multiple selection. So you can choose up to three here. And what we'd love to hear from the audience is what are the top areas that you think if your managers could perform more effectively would improve your sales performance, right? So which of these do you think are the top performance? You can choose up to three. It'd be really interesting, Norman, to see what our audience says today. Absolutely, and I'm just reflecting on your comment about sales coaching. So sales coaching probably is the most important action for managers. And in fact, of those five pillars that Ray showed on that diagram, uh, pretty much every client we work with is now looking at a sales coaching program. But broadly, you also have to think about how do we manage performance? So you think about managing a team, that's one of the manager's top performance. It's implied in the name sales manager. Tremendous emphasis on pipelines today. Is there really good velocity in the pipeline? Are we kind of moving deals you know, with velocity from stage to stage? Are there good exit criteria, sometimes called pipeline hygiene? Uh, Ray mentioned, you know, hiring the right salespeople is not easy. It's, it's more art than science, but really what are those competencies that drive your top performers? So there's a lot of areas we can really work on with sales managers. Again, we've looked at it kind of recruiting and hiring, managing the performance, managing a pipeline, coaching the team on skills, also mm -hmm. opportunity coaching, coaching on deals, and ultimately, you know, how do you lead and inspire and motivate a team? And I think in a hybrid world, that issue of motivating a team is, is even more challenging. And so it's gonna be really interesting to just see your thoughts on, you know, as our, as our participants today, uh, what are the top challenges, uh, you know, in terms of areas for improvement? Yeah, and we'll, we'll ask Elizabeth to uh, publish the results here. I think we, we probably have a quorum. Uh, we did get a question about what, what do we mean by forecasting and it's probably more uh, uh, important in a publicly held company, but, you know, really being able to look at the funnel and say, well, what are we going to close this month, this quarter? How are we going to do at the end? And, you know, we always talk about leading indicators, but we can't wait till the end of the quarter to see if we hit our number or not. But are we able to accurately predict the revenue stream? And I think that's such a valuable uh, topic to be able to look at the quality of that funnel and see if deals are moving through with velocity and if they're well qualified so that we can predict month to month, how, how are we going to end up and how close to the pin are we, right? How, how close to our number are we actually getting? So these results are really interesting because if you look at the two areas where you have, you know, above 60%, you have accelerate sales performance. So how do we get people to be uh, productive more, more quickly? How do we improve the performance of the people that are already on the team? Mm -hmm. And the improvement of selling skills, we think is directly related to accelerating sales performance. So these two really focus on two of those key pillars that we talked about, you know, just a, a slide back, which is managing sales performance and sales coaching as the drivers, obviously pipeline related to more accurate forecasts, better hiring decisions related to hiring, which is many companies are facing attrition, turnover, or even many companies are even growing their teams. So uh, it's a tight labor market, hiring the right people with the right experience and the right credentials. Motivation scored really highly. I mean, Ray, your take on this? Yeah, I mean, I think it, the having the cross section is really interesting because it's not one thing. And really that it is, you know, all of those pillars to some degree and we can't ignore any of those. I mean, those are really what those key skills for the frontline manager. And there are probably others you would add as well. Carl mentioned in the chat, you know, about team building. And especially these days, really thinking about our diversified workforce, equality, diversity, inclusion. So I think we should be considering that as well, you know, as we, we build our team. Uh, so great feedback from the audience here. So let's continue on here. Um, we want to get into, and this will be a deeper dive, into 
the actual training that uh, we can provide for those frontline managers? What does it mean to coach, manage, and lead? And then how do we implement that, you know, in a new world or, or in this collaborative environment? So Norman, maybe you could take us through what some of that training looks like. Yeah, I think it's really important to think about these as coach, manage, and lead. These are team uh, terms that are used uh, often by people in professional training and development. They're also used by the um, people who lead these sales teams, but they can mean different things to different people. So we kind of just want to share with you kind of our perspective on what good coaching looks like, what good management and performance looks like, and how to lead a team. And we did a study a couple of years ago, um, you know, which was really what are the key attributes of high performing sales teams. And number one on the list was sales coaching. We found of all the things that can move the dial on sales, having managers that are more effective coaches uh, really have the highest impact uh, for top performing teams. And I think when you think about coaching, a lot of it focuses on the coaching model, kind of this right side, you know, what's the coaching model? What are some of the challenges? Maybe how I'm going to allocate coaching time. But coaching really doesn't start there. Coaching really starts on the left side, which is how do I create a coaching culture and mindset? What's the difference between a manager, which is a little bit more top down and a coach, which is much more side by side? How do I get buy-in into the coaching process? How do I create a, an environment where there's an environment of trust? And only once you have that mindset and culture, then you get to the what do I coach on? Because I think managers, without getting collaboration, so we believe in co-assessment and really looking at skills and saying, okay, I'm going to work with one of our sales performers. We're going to jointly decide what two or three skills can we coach on. We're going to discuss those openly in a very respectful way where the, the, the manager is acting as a coach to assist, not to criticize, but really promote skills development. And then you can get into the, the, the how to coaching. So I always think of this as the why, what, and how, and not just necessarily how to coach, because I think people are struggling. Well, how do I create that culture where people are receptive? And how do I diagnose what to, what to coach on? And so I'm, I'm curious, and I just wanted to kind of pose a uh, quick question to our group. You know, what are some of the challenges your manager experience coaching remote sellers? Because many of the sellers today are still working from home. I'm in a home office today. I'm hybrid. Yesterday I was in my work office. So I'm just curious, you know, from our participants today, you know, what are the challenges, you know, you're seeing with remote sellers? And I know, Ray, you're working with numerous clients who are, are going through sales coaching programs. What are you hearing? Yeah, you know, I think this idea of coaching in a hybrid world is, is new and different. And, you know, in traditional, even when we think about ride alongs or field visits, we used to maybe plan a day where we'd go out and we'd spend a day, we'd observe uh, multiple sales calls, and then maybe we'd have lunch or at the end of the day, we'd debrief. And what we were hearing initially is, well, we can't do that anymore. You know, how do we coach? Because we can't be out there. I actually think there's an opportunity there to engage even further and in other ways but we need to get past that. And it'll be interesting to see what, uh, you know, what some of the challenges from our audience are seeing with, with coaching these days. I, I love that first comment that I saw come up, I think it was from Van Ann, which is you know, difficult to evaluate their ability. So if you're not going on face-to-face -face calls, you're joining them on Zoom, how do you really, and that's one of the reasons I think co-assessment is really important because you can provide your perspective, you can also get their perspective and have a great coaching conversation uh, even before I see focus and visibility coming up, uh, you know, it's not as easy to manage people remotely. We talked a little bit about that from uh, accountability. Role plays are more challenging, although there's some great technology. I just wrote a blog post on how you can leverage some of the technology related to call recordings. But mm -hmm. again, it doesn't really, it's really not a substitute for, for being there in person and, and doing those role plays. Uh, some of that can be done virtually. Ray, your thoughts on, on the comments? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a, a theme around just how do we motivate and, and if we can't see them. And we'll, I think this is really where the performance management and coaching are really tied together. You know, going back to being really clear about setting expectations and what do we expect day in and day out? Because what people don't appreciate is just being pushed harder and harder and harder to hit a number versus somebody said, well, it's the habits as opposed to just the results. And we say behaviors, right? But what are those behaviors that we can help them achieve? How do we coach them to improve those skills? And we believe we'll get the results if, if we're able to do that. You know, I see the theme of motivation come up a couple of times. It's hard to motivate when people are working remotely. People have a lot of challenges. Obviously there's 
personal and professional challenges associated with you know what we've been all going through the last year and a half. But what I would say is motivation actually takes uh, deliberate planning. You have to really work with each person. Motivation is not simply just about giving, having a sales team meeting and giving some inspirational speech that'll last about 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. It's really making a personal connection with each person, understanding what's going on in their lives. What is it about their work that they find satisfying? What is it they find challenging? And they're really looking for those personal motivators and how you can play into what really motivates them. So motivation is challenging, but if you take a deliberate view of, mo of motivation, and we cover that in the area of being a sales leader, how do you work with each member of your team to, to motivate them? So it's an interesting challenge. And I think one that's become much more pronounced in a hybrid world. Yeah, I think we should appreciate and, and recognize that things have changed and you know, figure out, well, how do we adapt in this world uh, that likely is to continue to have some component of hybrid. Most organizations are going to see some of that. So Norman, you know, what, what are some of the things that uh, you would add around coaching in this hybrid world? I think pre-call coaching, there's an opportunity to collaborate. I know that when we work with our sales team, we always have a game plan going into a call. I think one of the most difficult challenges for a manager is to resist selling. And we often use the term of three different types of calls. I'm going to keep it fairly short, but it could be I'm a manager and I'm joining you for a joint sales call, meaning we're both going in there with the idea of helping close business. Uh, we got to then understand what our roles are on the call. So we're not talking over each other. and We're really listening to the customer, but much more important to be a coaching call where I'm coming in. I only comment briefly and I'm really coming in to observe and because for every call I can join, there's probably seven or eight calls that I'm not on with my salesperson. So really understanding, putting together a game plan, you know, obviously it's pretty easy to join virtual meetings. I mentioned I'm slammed today, meeting, meeting, meeting. Uh, listen to call recordings. There's some great technology we can use to debrief. We don't have to do it now in front of the customer. We can sit down and have some one-on-one -on -one coaching times. Coach after the fact. Don't try and coach in the moment. I think it's really frustrating for a sales rep to get instant messages when they're selling and they're trying to read their boss's instant message and, and, and connect with a customer better to kind of save those comments. And, you know, it's not easy to do. Uh, it's tempting to send the message right away, but probably better coach after the fact. And then the issue came up just a minute ago in the chat about role plays. We think you can do some great simul sales simulations using Zoom. It's also just a chance to connect one-on-one -on -one outside of a selling uh, situation. So coaching hybrid teams, I think is challenging, but there's also um, some really good techniques we could use to, to make it effective. Yeah, and I think this is just going to continue to emerge. And as you said, with, with some of the call technology and conversational intelligence tools coming out and things like Gong or Refract or Chorus, where we're really able to not just see, well, what was the transcript, but see, well, how much did the rep talk? How many questions did they ask? Uh, how long was the pause in between or how many ums and ands? I mean, really, we can take a deep dive. I think we have to be a little careful with that. It doesn't remove the manager's responsibility, but if we can use some of that analytics and background to inform the coaching conversation, now it's not my opinion against your opinion, but we have a, a, a record to look at and say, well, let's break this down. What do we like about it? What might be we do differently? What are we gonna do going forward? So let's talk about a couple of the other areas. We said coach, manage, lead. So this is around the management piece and really just a very simple framework for what, what we consider managing sales performance or performance management. The idea that we need to be really clear about the success factors we're looking for, and then looking at the behaviors and the indicators that we're gonna track to see if we're uh, accomplishing or at least headed in the right direction towards accomplishing those objectives. And I think these days, and this has always been a, a great framework, but even more so today where we can't see them, Maybe we go uh, for a period of time without having that face-to-face -face or without really knowing what's going on, but at least we can track how we're doing towards these goals, these leading indicators. And if there's a gap, then start to understand the root cause. So we often find, especially in our workshops, that managers are quick to jump to the action. Well, that's a training problem, or I'm gonna put them on a PIP, a performance improvement plan, or they're not motivated. We really maybe are skipping the steps saying, well, why is this happening? Do they know how to do it? Are there roadblocks in their way? Have we been clear about the expectations and given them feedback? So there are a number of different things we wanna investigate so that we can take the appropriate action or actions to get them back on track. And I think this framework is a great way 
of thinking about managing a, a team, especially in this hybrid or remote workforce. Any comments you'd add to this, Norman? I just think that, you know, for in, the, in our workshops, a light bulb goes off for the managers when they really can start to diagnose, okay, here's the results that, that we're looking for. <clears throat> Here are the behaviors that are going to drive those results and then really starting to analyze the behaviors as opposed to analyzing the results and then understanding where there might be performance gaps. And I think you're right too often they're going to jump to an action without really understanding the cause. And so I think this framework just slows things down a little bit and allows for a lot better and more deliberate decision making and a much more thoughtful analysis of what's how do I actually improve a performance as opposed to just monitor performance. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, and love to spend more time on this and happy to, you know, get into it in more detail if people are interested at a future date. But let's just talk about this leadership piece as well. We said coach, manage, lead. And this came up in a number of the chats, right, about the motivation and how are we engaging our team. And we think leadership includes a number of different components, but it really starts with what's the vision for our sales team? How does that support the corporate vision, maybe the corporate sales vision of you know, growing revenue? But I, we believe that frontline managers should have their own vision for the team. Are they trying to get everybody to President's Club? Are they trying to expand the territory? Are they trying to take share away from the competition? Right? What are those things that are motivating? And what we know about salespeople is if we can get them aligned with that vision, they're more likely to lean in right, and have that little bit more motivation towards a goal. And so we really want to think about what's the vision for the team? How are we making strategic decisions? We introduce a, a decision-making framework, how we influence and motivate uh, our team. And, and we break that down specifically. You know, Some team members are very motivated by money, but that's not the only thing. We need to think about the uh, opportunity, right? Or being part of the team or just doing good work and being independent. So um, how are we recognizing providing visibility to our team members and really figuring out what makes them tick because motivators can be very different uh, for those individuals. And then ultimately taking responsibility for you know, our own development as a leader, those personal abilities. So uh, again, much more we could get into, but we wanna spend leave a little bit of time to just talk about the learning environment and this collaborative learning experience, taking this coach manage lead framework and uh, seeing how we apply it, how we get our managers on board. So I think one of the most interesting things that we've seen is the way that learning has changed and being able to leverage platforms where you really can start to create digital journeys for and for learning. And, you know, if we think about this, so really just how do you make learning much more engaging? And if we just look at the next chart, I'll kind of just share with you just a perspective on, on learning. So we look at traditional e-learning, you know, I had micro learning, it was 24 seven and it was highly scalable. But really, you know, at least from our perspective, traditional e-learning had a low level of engagement. If you look at ILT and VILT, and pretty much everything's been VILT probably for the last year and a half, we're starting to see some ILT open up again. Mm -hmm. Benefit of a life facilitator, you have some exercises and assignments, you have your role plays, you have your discussions. And you know, it can be customized. Certainly you can customize the materials, you can customize the learning experience, the way the course is facilitated using highly uh, relative, you know, relevant examples, but on CLX, which stands for you know collaborative learning experience, that's what we're really trying to build. And leveraging technology, we can have kind of the best of both worlds. And what what I found, just working with a client on this, is that by having them, and you know, if we just bring up one more chart here, I think you'll get a better sense for what that looks like. But really, it's almost a flipped classroom where participants are going through, collaborating, doing the work together, and then. They're able to do much more thoughtful work. They're able to do the missions and the exercises and then participate in weekly cohort sessions. And now, Ray, you're working with a number of clients that deployed this, uh, large technology companies, industrial companies. Can you just share what that experience looks like? Yeah, and I think it really is an interesting evolution to see how that blended digital experience is more engaging. So, you know, having that traditional micro learning, maybe it's the short videos, but enhancing that with live sessions. Uh, and making it very engaging. So, you know, we're talking three to five minute videos, not 20 minute episodes or, or uh, you know, laborious training that, that is challenging to get through, but then applying it in the flow of work or in real time. So love, you know, we have six week, eight week learning journeys where each week they have a mission, an assignment to apply that 
to their team or to uh, use the tool that's been introduced and then come back and talk about it. So collaborate, they can see each other's work. As a facilitator, I love the fact that now we can actually see how they're applying the skills, provide some coaching in real time, and also they can see what good looks like from their peers as well. And, and a benefit of that is so much more of the time in the classroom time when you have the virtual instructor-led sessions following up is be reviewing real work. And so the uh, group cohort time is really being spent around skill application. And so, so much of the work is being done in advance, again, and being more thoughtful and more mindful in completing that work. And then you have these very rich discussions about you know, how can we apply this real world based on the examples they've submitted. Absolutely. And so, you know, just having a, a, a platform, a place, as you mentioned, we branded it as the collaborative learning experience CLX, but, you know, that idea of an experience learning platform, I think is very valuable. Having the tools and resources all in one place so they know where to go. You're not digging through email or trying to find uh, the references. And then having, we'll talk, touch on this just briefly, but uh, progress along the way. So a leaderboard with some points assigned and they can see their progress, very motivating. It's amazing with salespeople, you know, how, how competitive uh, they can be to, to finish that program. And, and one of the ancillary benefits that we've seen is that it is a great way to unite remote teams. We have people from all over the world kind of in the same cohorts, geographically distributed, but they're all together every week in this platform at their own times, but commenting on each other's work and being able to share experiences uh, before they come back to a weekly cohort session. So this is really a digital blend where the content is metered out over several weeks. It really incorporates the idea of a flipped classroom and space learning and focusing our precious classroom time on, on skill application. Absolutely. And we'll just give a couple of short uh, examples here just so you can kind of see that experience. And then I want to make sure we save some time for questions. I think Elizabeth just put in, if you have a question, feel free to add it into the Q&A. Uh, and we'll try to touch on those at the end. But, you know, just thinking about that experience, it's very engaging. They're consuming the content. You know, each of these orange bars end up being an accordion that expands that ha may have a video, a content tile. We're actually doing something unique, I think, that uh, is incorporating what we call voice of the seller videos. So interviewing top sellers and bringing their voice in and saying, well, let's have them talk about how they're responding or a top manager how do they respond to coaching and, and overcome some of these challenges? Uh, so we can bring that in throughout. It makes it very engaging, easy to consume week by week. And then the collaborative aspect of that where, you know, this is one of the missions. They have to introduce themselves, upload a fun picture, and talk about some of their goals and challenges uh, with respect to the program. So immediately they're connecting, especially with a global audience. They're now connecting with people they may have never even met, but collaborating as they go through the program as a cohort group, which we think is very valuable. And then, you know, the leaderboard and badges kind of showing that progress towards an end game. And Norman, I know you've been working with clients on this as well and seeing the, uh, the success and, and the, the competition that goes with that. Maybe you could comment a little bit on, uh, you know, the-, the Yeah, uh, I think this it, idea of metering out the content. So if you think about this, there's like a weekly, actually it goes out twice a week, a communication, just sharing, you know, here's what this week's assignments are like. If you get started early, it'll take about two, two hours to complete. Here's how many points you can earn. People go in, they do the work. The facilitator goes in and comments on the work. Their peers comment on the work. And then you just bring some of that real world work from the platform into your weekly um, sessions. Everyone's connecting. They have a lot of visibility. People want to be on, on the leaderboard. It's not super competitive because basically everyone can, you know, get the point total required to earn all the badges and to earn the Credly badge. So we're, we're seeing it as really exciting. And I, 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 you know, I wrote a blog post on this, but I, I actually think it leads to better training outcomes because we ask someone in a live session to come up with, uh, you know, to do some work, they're distracted, you know, they're kind of thinking on the fly, but we ask them during the course of a week to think about something, they're a lot more meaningful. And so when I saw the exercises and the quality of the, we call them missions, but they're really, you know, they're exercises that the participants are completing, the quality is so high that we're able to bring in some really well thought out examples. For example, maybe it's on overcoming objections or pre-call planning or qualifying opportunities. All those are things that are coming into, into the weekly sessions. Yeah, absolutely. It's been really fun to see the, the progress along uh, and the skill application. And then really culminating in, and, and we partner with Credly. So it's a third party 
a credential that is able to say they've satisfied these criteria. It's a digital badge they can use on their LinkedIn. They can share with others and it gives them really an accomplishment, right, for going through. So I know we want to leave time for questions. Norman, maybe you could just sum, sum up a little sure. bit here think, and, and uh, we'll see what others have to say. Number one, we, as, as Ray said at the beginning, we're passionate about training sales managers. We think it's more important than ever given the hybrid environments and some of the issues that you all brought up around staying connected and motivating the team. Really focusing on key sales management skills, kind of three key buckets there, sales coaching, both skills coaching and opportunity coaching managing performance and really having a framework to consistently manage performance really difficult when people are more disconnected and more distracted leading and motivating your team that needs to be intentional what is the vision how does everyone play into that vision bringing that sense of team and unity together and then having some personal conversation about what motivates each member of your team and we think the best training experience is really collaborative produces we think much better learning outcomes much higher levels of engagement so you know at SRG, we deliver training, instructor-led, virtual instructor-led, but if someone asked us what we think works best, based on our experience last year and a half, I'd say the collaborative learning is really is really a game changer. So we're kind of quite excited. We'd love to take some questions, answer anything we can about sales management training, uh, the skill areas, or really whatever's on your mind. So let me turn that back to our group and say thank you from me and, and Ray, and let you know we've really appreciated all the support we get from training industry and what a wonderful uh, participation we've had today during uh, during this session. Yeah, absolutely. Great engagement. Uh, I'll always have a sharp audience with training industry. So Elizabeth, have we uh, received any additional questions and love to take, I think we have a few minutes here if, uh, if others have questions. Absolutely, yes, thank you. We do have a few questions here for you. Um, um, let's jump to this first one from Jen, who's wondering, how do you get managers to implement the new skills they learned? So that's a great question, because when you think about skill application for managers, it often is about implementing. So if we have, from our perspective, we really think it's about having a cadence where there's an expectation of what's going to be done and also arming them with the tools. If the training is too theoretical in nature, it might change the way they think about things, but may not change the actions. There needs to be practical application tools. So for example, in managing sales performance, we have a way of assessing the entire team, understanding what those performance gaps are, putting together a deliberate plan, something like that might be done semi-annually. On coaching, we have a cadence of quarterly, you can basically assess skills, work on just one or two skills per, per, per person. And it's really having the tools to do that and providing the leader of the managers with the visibility as to the progress. So it isn't easy to change behavior. Managers are probably some of the busiest people in an organization, the sales managers. But again, giving them a simple, a few simple tools and not trying to apply everything you learned. A lot of it can just really stay in your, in your head, but taking a few key nuggets from that that can really move the dial on results and focusing on doing a few things differently and better than you used to do them. Awesome. Thanks, Norman. All right, I'm going to jump right into our next question from Delane, who is wondering, what kind of tech stack do we need to support this? You know, maybe other than an LMS, what other tools do we need for that CLX that you mentioned? Yeah, and, and, and I can take that one. And I mean, there are certainly a number of emerging tools and, and it can be built in, in a number of ways. A lot of LMSs have some of this capability. Um, we are actually showing, we partner with Intrepid as one of the options, but I also see, I know Allego is a sponsor and they have a fantastic collaborative learning platform. I see John, George on here. Uh, so yeah, there's an emerging trend, I think, to incorporate more of the social and the engagement and collaboration into learning. And so there are a number of tools and we're happy to you know, take that as a, as a further discussion if anybody would like to dive into that in more detail. All right. Thanks, Ray. Okay, next question is from Maria, who says, you know, time is really precious for, for, for your sales team, right? So how can we help with ensuring that time is allocated for training? I think that this idea of digital learnings is really important. We're obviously talking today from a sales management lens on high impact sales manager, but also if you think about sales training programs, the example I was actually giving before was from a client we're working with on deployment of an onboarding program. And I think the idea of getting away from these long um, 
workshops, which we traditionally did when we had ILT, and really chunking out the learning and spacing out the learning. So even though we could provide, for example, in the collaborative learning experience, access to all of the materials at once, we actually only make one section available per week. This way we're chunking it out to one to two hours per week. Uh, they really can't do more. They can't get too far ahead of the class. We don't want them to. We want everyone just to stay on pace. And by keeping it meaningful and manageable, we can meter it out in a way where it's not overwhelming. It doesn't get in the way of their normal workflow. And again, we think about during using this digital journey about two hours of non-classroom time a week, followed by one hour of classroom time. So total allocation of time might be three hours a week over an eight week learning journey. And if I could just add to that, because there was another question I saw pop up, I think is relevant to that. It's how do you keep the, the content fresh mm -hmm. and engaging and relevant? And I think this does that also in, in just a really unique way that we have the opportunity to record just in time videos to complement the training. So if something comes up during that week and, and it's a common thread, we can do that quick you know, two minute video and say, this came up, here's the situation. Or we can highlight, Norman's been doing Academy Awards with one of our groups to say, here is a great example to this objection that's coming up or this challenge. Well, let's showcase that in real time. I would take relevancy over production value any day. So we can do a, a nice just-in-time video that complements the training without having to go spend $100,000 in the studio. So there's a lot of creative ways that this is emerging. All right, thank you. Well, we are out of time, but I'm hoping maybe we can squeeze in one more question. Um, here's one from Marcus, who is wondering if you have any tips on how to organize collaborative coaching with top and poor performers without disengaging these two different levels of performers. So I think the coaching needs to be individualized. I mentioned in one of our slides about time allocation. And uh, actually ties to a blog post I just uh, released on that kind of dealt to dealt with some of the new technologies available that Ray was mentioning for analyzing calls. But if you think about a sales team, you have your middle performers, your top performers, and your low performers. The power of coaching, which is different than training, is that coaching can be individualized for each person based on unique skills. And in terms of just allocation. We'd say the best return on investment really comes from moving the middle. So you have a team of eight salespeople with four in the middle. That would be your highest time allocation because just moving the middle has the biggest impact. We'd send then the, the, the high performers, the high performers, you're really trying to move them to empowerment because they probably are doing most of the skills well, but they can still have a huge um, uh, impact on overall revenue just based on the size of the quotas they're carrying and their success. And I think coaching a low performers, you know, is still important, but I think a lot of managers kind of get in a time suck where they're spending way too much time with low performers and the issues there may go way beyond skills. So I, I kind of separate two buckets of low performers, those that might be new hires and they're used to spend a lot of time because they may have a lot of potential. But if you have chronic low performers, it may take a lot more than coaching. It may, there may be some performance counseling or some other actions that the manager needs to consider. So. If you have managers who are finding themselves spending way, way too much time with chronic low performers, mm -hmm. it probably is more than a coaching uh, issue. 